Hi Fools, welcome to Market Checkup, the Motley Fools healthcare focused investing show. I'm David Williamson and I'm joined as usual with by Michael Douglas. Michael, thank you for uh, being here today. Good to we be here. We have a jam-packed show for you. We have uh, uh, a stock standing out for all the wrong reasons. Uh, we have a, a partnership deal, uh, changes to Medicare, uh, Obamacare news, uh, possibly uh, some new regulations around cigarettes. But let's start with uh, our big mover. Unfortunately, stocks are selling off in a big way uh, to close out the week. It seems like every Friday, Michael, uh, is a down day. It just really puts a damper on my whole weekend mood. But uh, you know, on a bad day like this, you don't really want to stand out for being even worse. But mm -hmm. you know, that's what's happening with Halazyme shares are cratering. They're down 25%. They're actually doing even worse than that uh, right before we came up here to, to shoot. Uh, and it's because there's now uh, a clinical hold on uh, one of its drugs uh, that's in trials for pancreatic cancer uh, regarding some safety issues. Mm -hmm. uh, wh what's going on there? So what, what the drug's called PGH, uh, sorry, PG, PEGPH20. Uh, well, rolls right off the tongue. Yeah, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of letters there. And it's uh, uh, basically what they've done is they've done a precautionary, uh, basically they've, they've stopped enrollment because there's a concern about some thromboembolic uh, events. So basically... Uh, possible embolisms, possible uh, thrombotic events. So basically we're talking blood vessels yep. being blocked. Uh, blocked by yeah. part of a clot or something like that. Um, you know, we really don't know uh, much yet about it, but this is obviously not great news, sort of from the safety perspective, especially because this is a phase two trial, yeah. sort of meant to establish that safety issue. Um, yeah, and usually, you know, major issues tend to crop up in phase three when right. on the large scale trials. <laughs> right, uh, so, so not great news there. Um, that said, you know, pancreatic cancer is the pretty much the worst prognosis uh, for cancer as a whole. Um, and so I think we'll be interested to see sort of what happens from here. We really don't have enough information yet to really move forward. Um, mm -hmm. This isn't a stock that I would be buying personally, um, but I'm uh, yeah, a little bit opinion, more concerned. In your opinion, where do, you, where do you think this leaves Halazyme then? Well, I mean, so you this know, post is... post sell-off. <laughs> right. So, I mean, this is a pretty small revenue company, right? 55 yeah. million in sales uh, or in revenue last year. Um, a lot of it coming through... Um, the partnership with Roche, they get a single digit percent of net sales on Herceptin and a couple of other yeah. drugs. Um, but, you know, they burned through 49 million in cash last year. They've got 71 and a half million in the bank. It's not really, not really not a, my style of investing. So yep. uh, I, I'm going to say, let's wait and hear more information, but not good news. And I would stay safely on the sidelines and monitor from there. I think that's a that's a safe call. You know, as, as fools, you want to hold long term, and, and when you have a company that is a key product that, mm -hmm. that could have some safety issues early on in development, might not be a stock you want to you want to think about holding long term. So I yeah. think I think the sit on the sidelines approach is probably the right one. <laughs> and uh, as we move from a stock that's having a bad day, uh, let's move toward a stock that's really been having a bad year, <laughs> which is uh, which is Amarin. It's it, it's a popular stock out mm -hmm. there, but. Uh, Unfortunately, it's had a tough go of it, although uh, made some good progress. They have now a uh, sales partner, mm -hmm. which is something that investors have been hoping for, um, for their drug Vasipa. The, the partner is Japanese pharmaceutical company Kawa. Uh, sales reps for Vasipa are nearly tripling. Right, right now it's uh, 130. It's going to uh, 380. Uh, what do you think about the deal? Well, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good deal for them uh, for a number of reasons. One is... Um, a lot of these sales reps are already kind of in touch with the same doctors that they'd want to be um, getting Vasipa to. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a lot of your um, uh, triglyceride yeah. uh, issues. So, so that's good news for them there, and that should be a pretty easy add-on for Kawa's sales reps. Um, and frankly, Amber needs the help, right? I mean, <laughs> last year we're talking 26 million for the drug, 10 million of which was in the fourth quarter. To be fair, after they laid off a bunch of sales reps, so yeah. that may not be really representative. So, I think we'll see a lot more moving forward. Um, but, you know, frankly, this particular market, the, uh, the uh, severe hypertriglyceridemia yes. market, again, rolls off the tongue, <laughs> um, is already pretty crowded, right? So, yes. you know, you've got uh, competitors, uh, GSK, sorry, GlaxoSmithKline yep. and uh, Teva. Yep. And uh, Loveza, which is uh, mm -hmm. Glaxo's drug, is a... Uh, Basically a blockbuster. It, right. it hovers right under, but so I'll, I'll nine hundred and twenty-six yeah. million or something like I'll that. I'll call it. Uh, I'll call it a blockbuster. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that had a lot of enthusiasm around Amarin's drug mm -hmm. uh, as its efficacy was a little better. Right. Um, it had you know some extra benefits for taking it. So 
you know, there was also, the real story with Amarin wasn't just fighting in the severe level, it was moving into the high level and expanding that patient population from under 5 million to basically over 30 million. And, and that's really where the money was going to be made. Unfortunately, there were some studies that came out that said, uh, you know, fighting triglycerides might not actually lead to better cardiovascular outcomes, which right. is why you would be taking these drugs ultimately. Uh, you know, it's not just uh, moving triglycerides in a vacuum. Uh, so, you know, that, that ended up causing them to lose essentially this anchor indication they were going for. Right. Uh, I think this is a good deal. Uh, you know, Ameren's going to have to start paying, uh, you know, single digit uh, royalties off mm -hmm. sales, moving up to about 20%. But if they can boost sales dramatically, that's, you know, 20% of giving away 20% of something is better than keeping 100% of nothing. Right. So, you know, I, I think that's a good deal. That my concern is, especially in the severe indication where Loveza is only, mm -hmm. it, it hasn't moved outside that, uh, that's a drug that's going generic. So, you know, that area is going to be really hard to get gain ground on. So, you know, the, the thing with Amarin long term is you need it to have the reduce it trial, which is in conjunction with a statin. You need to see better outcomes from that. Yeah. AstraZeneca uh, acquired a company called Omthera uh, to get their drug Epinova. Mm -hmm. it, it's similar to Amarin's. It actually has a slightly better dosing to it. Um, so there's, you know, there's a competitive threat right there. But you know, for Amarin to be successful long term, they need a good outcome in the reducer trial. That's years off. So anything they can do to boost sales and, and keep the lights on right. while they're running that large, expensive trial, uh, I think that's good news for shareholders. For sure. All right. Well, let's move on from some individual uh, stocks. Actually, we got one more. Yeah. I don't know, I'm, I'm jumping the gun. I, yeah, got, I, got, I got a little excited. I got a little excited. Because okay. it's new. It's new. It hasn't yeah. been around. Uh, so let's welcome IMS Health uh, back to the public markets. Now, this was uh, a company that actually was public about four years ago. It was taken uh, private by TPG Capital, and uh, it's, it's back. They IPO'd. Um, they had a pretty solid IPO. It's up, uh, up over 10%. Um, and it, it's sort of interesting, too, to see uh, healthcare IT get on this IPO bonanza for, for healthcare because, you know, biotech's gone crazy. We had, what, 38 in 2013 where... We're almost halfway there, and we, we barely started 2014. So right. it looks to be, a, you know, a, just an even more banner year. But but healthcare IT is ramping up, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, IMS is is a pretty well known company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and and so so a lot of what they do is uh, they sell subscriptions and license based contracts. They aggregate drugs or sort of what have you, and they're they're considered a, a pretty good player in the area. Um, I happen to like. I happen to really like. Um, uh, subscription models. I think they're very scalable. They yep. tend to be very good for cash flow long term, uh, and you can sort of do these. You get these sticky relationships, right? You can do these and do gradual add-ons to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's really good news. And and this isn't as uh, overvalued, perhaps some would say, as yeah. some of these biotechs have been historically. I mean, we're talking. Uh, you know, this isn't a preclinical company with yeah. a two billion dollar market cap. It's what six six billion and some yeah, change. It's about six point three. They did two point five billion in revenue last year. Exactly. Raised one point three billion from the deal. So. Right. Um, operating margin in the mid teens. Yeah. I, so so really, I I like what I'm seeing. Um, I think. We'll want to see some more revenue growth. Uh, yeah, they, they've been pretty pretty slow on the uptake there for the last three and, years. And I think they they have been acquiring some companies. They spent about uh, almost a billion dollars. I think it was around nine hundred million. Right. Uh, trying to get some new additions and, and grow, become a little more consumer facing. Right. So we'll see how some of that M and A is accretive to EPS long term. But uh, but overall, you know, I, I feel a lot better about that than I have about a lot of the IPOs so far this well, year. Well, I think even in healthcare IT too, because you you look around and uh, it's. It, you, you see some companies that resemble, in a lot of ways, more that biotech model where they're sure. still trying to figure out what they're doing. And, and there's been a lot of enthusiasm for how, uh, you know, big data and access to information and healthcare IT can change things. But, I mean, you know, Castlight is, is a great example of Classic this, right? Classic example. Which, which uh, you know, it, it had a pop, right? Mm -hmm. And it's basically traded down every day since. It's, it's down 43%, I think, since the IPO. I believe you yeah. thumbed it down in caps. I, I did, and I'm very pleased about that, yeah. too. <laughs> Everyone should play Motley Fool caps out there. It's, yeah. uh, it's worth your time. It's oh, for a sure. Lot of fun. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's, that's a company that, uh, I mean, maybe you want to talk about it a little. But well, uh, it's... It's definitely the opposite of IMS, which is a stable company that's been around for a long time. Right. So I mean, with Castlight, you know, you're looking at this company that that has some of the 
largest companies in the world as clients, right? People like Walmart, and it's not generating much revenue. So, yeah. so your question then is, okay, so where are you going to generate that additional yeah. revenue from yeah. that? I mean, where, where's the growth opportunity? I mean, if they were uh, generating the relatively small amount of revenue from, I don't know, a couple of smaller companies, a few startups, and they're trying to pitch it to like Glaxo. To a, to a Walmart. Yeah, yeah, or to Glaxo, yeah. then that would make sense. Yeah. But if you're already, have got these huge companies bought in, where's your... Where's your growth proposition? I just yeah. I just didn't see it as strongly for Castlight, and and so far at least yeah. the, the, the market has agreed. But you know we'll see long term. Yeah, well that's definitely a stock to watch, and I think mm -hmm. this area is really exciting for healthcare. Yeah. So, uh, you know the more companies that IPO here, the merrier, and uh, we'll be we'll be covering them actively here at Full.com. We will. So uh, let's move on. Now we're going to move on to Medicare. All right. Uh, I was just so excited, Michael. I appreciate it. And that. Uh, <laughs> although I think uh, a lot of people in hospitals aren't excited about some of the changes that have been coming to Medicare, and, mm -hmm. and especially when it comes to diagnosis codes, uh, you know, a lot of the Affordable Care Act was designed to streamline and, and, and make things easier and, mm -hmm. and uh, promote, uh, you know, there was promotion of electronic health records in the High Tech Act, but it looks like diagnosis codes at hospitals have gone from 16,000 all the way to 68,000. So it's a lot more specific, but a lot more complicated. Right. Well, and so, you know, this particular change, the, the move from ICD-9 to ICD-10. Yep. Um, also, by the way, procedures, 3,000 to 87,000 codes. So a big difference <laughs> even more. there. That's even more. Right. I mean. So that's been delayed for a year now with yeah. the uh, sustainable growth rate patch in Medicare that was passed earlier this Which week. Which is the doc fix. Right, exactly. Yeah. That was passed earlier this week. Um, this is going to be really good for generating better specificity. Um, something that you and I have talked about a lot here uh, is things like ACOs um, and population-centered health. Mm -hmm. These are going to give the sort of uh, ability to drill down and really understand what's going on. Um, that's going to really help uh, as sort of integrated care, population health management really becomes more of a thing. Yep. Um, if that, in fact, as we believe is a long-term trend, continues to be a long-term trend. Um, so I think long-term it's going to be a very good thing. Yeah. Obviously there are going to be some growing pains, yeah, especially when you're growing from you know this amount to this amount in I, terms I, of codes. I think one thing we've seen is that implementation when it comes to large-scale health policy changes is a lot easier said than done. Right. And I think that's why this delay makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. it, it gives these companies a one-year reprieve to really hopefully get everything working uh, by the time they need to. Of course, as you can imagine, there are some people who are very unhappy about this. Yeah. Uh, Athena Health, Cerner, McKesson, a lot of your EHR companies. Um, Athena, actually, the COO, Ed Parks, said, it is alarmingly clear that healthcare is operating in an environment where there is no penalty for not being able to keep pace with necessary steps and deadlines to move the industry forward. Uh, our system is already woefully behind in embracing technology to drive further information quality. Uh, so obviously Athena, not too pleased about it. Yeah. Um, and, and understandably so, right? Because they've been prepping for this. It's they deferred been, business for them. Exactly. They've yeah. been selling these products and yep. now the value proposition moves back another year. Um, Nonetheless, you know, I think this is a great space to be in with yep. these sort of uh, healthcare IT companies. Um, you know, you've got Cerner, uh, for example, which is really uh, moving to try and challenge Epic Systems, which is privately held um, in a large hospital IT market. Yep. Um, between them and Epic, it's 75%. Yeah, network. Epic is really the dominant player. Oh, for sure. Um, Epic has uh, about two large hospital contracts for every one Cerner does. Yeah. But between them, they're about 75% of that large hospital market. So that's good news for Cerner shareholders, obviously. Um, and uh, you know McKesson's a bit more kind of a kind of more broad based. Uh, they yeah. do some of the the pharmaceutical sourcing. Uh, they just um, signed a new deal with Rite Aid, uh, extending their relationship through 2019, um, and they uh, um, do the sourcing and distribution for them. And then finally, of course, you've got Athena Health, yes. uh, which is a lot smaller, growing a lot faster. Right, so revenues up. Uh, it's more than tripled in the last five years to about 600 million. Um, of course, what that means is when you're growing that quickly, you're going to have a very rich valuation. And, yes. it's, uh, and they do. <laughs> uh, it's uh, I, I, a little over 2,000 times trailing earnings per share uh, for the past 12 months. So definitely a space we're going to want to watch uh, very closely, and, and we'll be reporting, I think, on, on more as it comes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Athena looks a little better when you look at uh, forward earnings estimates, but right. still it's, uh, it's pretty astronomically yeah, high. It, but, it's a pretty expensive company. But they're in a good place, and they've done a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, working with the government and, and getting uh, getting their systems implemented, and they're being aggressive. I, I, I think of those, that's definitely a stock that you want to watch. Yeah, for sure. 
Uh, all right, so let's move from Medicare to Obamacare, which is everyone's uh, favorite topic. Everyone's favorite topic. <laughs> it's, it's our weekly segment. But uh, big news, yeah. the open enrollment period ended. Uh, so this is our first show post-open enrollment. Uh, we had bets of where it would end up. We were just hilariously low. <laughs> um, your original guess was six million on the nose. Mine was five point nine, which I then bumped up to six point three. Uh, I'm going to give you the victory, the I original victory. That. <laughs> um, it comes in at seven point one. Neither of us are really victors, though, for right. being so far off. But you know what? Everyone was off. I really, I don't feel too bad about this because just we knew there was going to be a surge at the end. Mm -hmm. But I think the size of the surge is what really uh, took people off guard. But yeah, seven point one million is mm -hmm. the official enrollment number. Right. Well, and of course, that doesn't include Medicaid uh, expansion. That doesn't include the, yep. the sort of woodwork effect in Medicaid, where a bunch of people who were previously eligible for Medicaid, when they started hearing about it, they said, oh, well, wait a minute. I've always been eligible. Let me go ahead. Look, now's a good time. Yeah. Um, you know, people uh, enrolling on their parents' insurance through age 26. Yeah. Uh, people getting in, in individual insurance on a, on a private market or just not on the exchanges. So, so there's been a, a real boost here in the, in the insured population from the Affordable Care Act. Um, yeah. And it's going to keep going. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. We, we talked about that expansion into, you know, we don't know when enrollment's actually going to end. If you, uh, you know, you had some difficulty signing up, it, it turns out they've clarified that it's going to be 60 days mm -hmm. uh, of additional er enrollment, which should probably take that number, you would think, over 8 million probably. Um, there's probably about that much out there. And then you have the special enrollment period. Mm -hmm. So enrollment never really totally ends, but open it's you have to have these deadlines, but uh, even though open enrollment's over, special enrollment's for, you know, maybe you lost your job and you lost insurance through your job, then you can still go get an Affordable Care Act plan. Mm -hmm. um, and there's probably another, what, 5 million or so people, uh, 4 to 5 million that, that are probably going to enroll through that uh, through the year. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some churn. I, how much I think is going to be really, really difficult to identify, yeah. but uh, but certainly, certainly some movement there. Yeah, and I mean the the amount of reasons you can uh, you can update it. I mean they're pretty. It's it's pretty specific. There were some there were some. Uh, you, you don't even need like complete um, complete. Uh, documentation for most of them, so you right. can just say you know oh I couldn't enroll because of an error message or you know. You know, there was some sort of system error or, um, you know, there was a natural disaster of some right. kind. You know, my house flooded. I couldn't sign up in time. Sure. sure. Um, you know, Obamacare is going to keep going. I, I think the real takeaway, uh, if I can just, you know, take give investors one thing to take away, is that this late surge is probably going to be younger, healthier people. We mm -hmm. saw that in Massachusetts. There was a huge spike in that at the end. You know, both groups were kind of tracking somewhat in line, and then uh, healthy people spiked, younger people spiked at the end. So seeing such a, just a huge jump in the last month, a couple million in the last month, that's actually probably going to go really well for insurance companies who are concerned about risk pools before. Maybe Aetna's CEO will, will stop complaining for about a <laughs> month, month or two. Maybe, maybe he'll be singing a different tune. Because Aetna, I mean, if those risk pools really have shifted dramatically, and, and that seems to be the indication of where sort of when, Mass when this happened in Massachusetts, that's how it went. Um, if that happens, then I, we could be seeing um, lower increases in insurance premiums next year. Previously, they've been guiding for kind of uh, somewhere in the double digits. Yeah. It, maybe it'll be in the low teens or maybe even in the single digits. Uh, it's hard to say right now. Um, but, you know, WellPoint, obviously, happier than ever. I, yep. think, I think Edna will be less unhappy. And maybe, <laughs> maybe Humana won't. Um, they won't, be, won't even lose money, right, which they, is what they were guiding for. They had predicted that they would have to use the reinsurance fund, uh, which only happens if they lose 8% or more. And so, um, and so I think we may see some shift there. Obviously, hospitals, please, too. Yeah. Um, the more people who are covered, the less bad debt expense. Right. And that had been a real big problem for you know, community health systems, for example, uh, Tenet, uh, yeah. HCA. All of them had written off. And HCA and uh, Tenet had specifically said, you know, we expect to make this amount extra because of the Affordable Care Act. We'll see if that gets shifted a little bit more now. So well, we'll be watching. Potential upside there. Yes, potential upside. We'll be watching. And uh, we're also going to be watching... If we can stay in Washington, D.C., we're, we're going to be watching for possibly new regulation uh, around e-cigarettes. Now, the FDA is pushing uh, to have regulatory control over them. They currently mm -hmm. don't, which seems a little crazy to me. But uh, a 2009 law gave them regulatory control mm -hmm. over tobacco. Uh, but e-cigarettes, which are, you know, they, they heat up. 
Uh, I'm sure people have seen them out there. They, they basically heat up liquid nicotine into a vapor, which is then inhaled. Uh, that, that sort of skirted around that law, but uh, that looks like it's going to change. What does that mean to you, Michael? Well, for me, I think the, the big question is going to be, how the FDA decides to regulate them and how much they decide to regulate them. So mm -hmm. if they decide to give them the sort of stricter uh, stricter push like a lot of tobacco companies are getting, you know, things like you, know, you can't have the slick marketing campaign, yeah. you, you, you can't advertise to uh, certain groups, things like that, then that'll be one thing. There's but, been a lot of uh, complaint from watchdog groups about some of the flavors, like Tutti Frutti. They're yeah. saying that's trying to attract younger people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, I think a lot's going to depend on exactly what those regulations look like. Um, ultimately, uh, regulation makes sense. Uh, yeah. you, know, you, you do see some pretty broad dispersion uh, amongst you know, in sort of quality and type and things like that in e-cigarettes. So I think this will be a good thing long term, uh, in part because it will help people really um, be able to trust the product uh, yeah. and be able to identify kind of what they're looking for and what they want. Um, certainly, e-cigarettes could be a huge market opportunity. Uh, in fact, Bloomberg uh, Industries projects that e-cigarette sales might surpass regular cigarettes by 2023 or something like that. Of course, those sales haven't really quite uh, materialized yet, have they? No, they're not really that great right now, to be honest. Uh, you know, I was taking a look at Lorillard, uh, mm -hmm. which bought Blue uh, not that long ago. Not Lorillard, because of that, controls about half of the e-cigarette market, but in 2013, that half totaled $231 million. So yeah. really nowhere close to where traditional cigarettes are at all. Uh, it is growing at about a 25% clip right mm -hmm. now, uh, so that that's that's strong growth no matter how you cut it, uh, but it's not like necessarily true that that 25% clip is going to grow into perpetuity. Right. Uh, you would expect that as it grows bigger to slow down some, and mm -hmm. and furthermore, it's not really great for the cigarette industry either. Uh, the cost of goods sold for an e-cigarette significantly higher mm -hmm. uh, than a traditional cigarette. So you know the margins are going to end up being compressing as these. Uh, make up more and more of the business, but all of the companies, you know, whether it's Altria uh, or, or some of the other competitors, they're they're trying to get into this because they do see it as a growth avenue. Right. Um, you know, cigarette sales have uh, have had a tough time in this country for mm -hmm. for a while. Uh, international has been a little better to them, but um, you know, I I, I do think uh, I do think e-cigarettes will continue to to grow. Um, I just I don't think they're necessarily. I think that uh, Bloomberg analysts might be getting a little too excited about the potential. I, I, I don't think they're necessarily going to uh, surpass traditional cigarette sales unless there was a situation where traditional cigarette sales continued, you know, uh, some sort of steep w or went into some sort of steep decline mm -hmm. uh, where overall sales for, for both were at a much lower point than they are now. Sure. All right. Well, thank you for uh, Michael Douglas. I'm David Williamson. And uh, stay tuned for more market checkups and check back on fool.com for all your other healthcare news as well. As well. Fool on.